Hey everyone, Nurse Mike here from SimpleNursing.com. Today we're going to be talking about chest tubes. But before we get started, for my Simple Nursing members, let's make sure this info really sticks. Find this study guide in your membership and follow along throughout the video. Trust me, it'll make this a lot easier to understand. As you know, chest tubes are used to drain fluid, blood, or air from the pleural space within the lung in order to re-expand a collapsed lung. And so, the main purpose is to restore a normal negative pressure within the pleural space. Like with a pleural effusion, where we have fluid in the pleural lung space, or a hemothorax, that blood in that pleural lung space, and even pneumothorax, that air inside that lung space. Now, how does a chest tube work? Well, by inserting the tube into this pleural lung space, it simply sucks out that air, fluid, or blood into a closed, one-way drainage system. So naturally, we must keep the drainage system below the chest level to help with drainage. So Hesse mentions this, asking interventions for a client with a chest tube for a pneumothorax. And the answer is to keep the drainage below the chest level. Yes, gravity helps with drainage. Now for chest tube care, the three chambers to know for your nursing exams and the NCLEX is number one, the suction control chamber right here. Number two, the water seal chamber that also has an air leak gauge right here. And third, the collection chamber to measure output. So starting with number one, the suction control chamber. Key terms here, write this down. We want to see gentle, steady, or key terms, continuous bubbling. This means we have a good amount of suction being applied, especially with clients with a pneumothorax, that air inside the lung. Again, gentle, continuous bubbling means the chest tube is working, not vigorous or violent bubbling. This means that the suction is too high. So the memory trick we use, just think of a child sucking down a milkshake in the suction control chamber. We want gentle, continuous bubbling, not vigorous or violent bubbling, just like the milkshake. Vigorous bubbling is not good and could get a little bit messy. Next, we have the water seal chamber and air leak monitor. This guy acts as a one-way valve to help drain air and fluid from the lung and also prevents air from entering that chest cavity. Now, it's good to see a steady rise and fall with breathing. This is known as titling, and this is good. It means that the system is working correctly and keeping that negative pressure. Naturally, rising and falling with each breath. And this will naturally reduce as the lung re-expands. Now, continuous bubbling is very bad. Typically, it means that there's an air leak inside the system. Oh, no! But we'll cover this more in detail in a moment. So the memory trick, just think of a seal inside the ocean for the water seal. This seal floats up and down with the tides of the waves, nice and even every time it takes a breath. So this is tidling, that rise and fall with the tide. Now, a big no-no is we never want this seal to be blowing continuous bubbles under the water. So just think of a lifeguard saying, hey, no bubbling in the water, you seal. <laughs> so that's how I remember no continuous bubbling in the air leak chamber of the water seal. Now, Kaplan mentions, what is the best response by the nurse when a client is asking about titling in the water seal chamber? The answer is, it shows your lung has not yet re-expanded. And ATI mentions, possible indication of lung re-expansion? Well, titling in the water seal chamber has stopped. Yes, this could mean lung re-expansion. So if we no longer see this titling, those fluctuations up and down, again, it could mean two things. Either the lung has fully re-expanded, as ATI stated here, which is good news, and we can remove the tube. Or the bad news, we don't want this. It could indicate that a blockage, like a blood clot, is stuck in the tube, or maybe there's a kink somewhere inside the tube. So Kaplan mentions, monitor for fluctuation in the water seal. 
no fluctuation may indicate a blockage. So write down these key words. They use fluctuation instead of titling, basically the same thing. So no fluctuation may indicate that blockage. Next, we have the air leak monitor found right here near the water seal chamber. Now the NCLEX loves to ask about the location of this air leak gauge. So write down and know this location. Now, what do you think the air leak monitor does? Well, hmm, do you think it might monitor some air leaks? Well, yes. So the key point to write down is not that. The key point here, once again, is continuous bubbling is bad. This key term means we have an air leak. And Air leaks are not good here. There should be no continuous bubbling in the air leak chamber or the water seal. So just think it should not look like a hot tub in there. No hot tubs and no time machines. <laughs> now intermittent bubbling that comes and goes is perfectly normal. That typically happens when you sneeze or if the client coughs. Now third, the collection chamber. This helps to drain the fluid as well as the blood from the lung. We assess this chamber every hour for the first eight hours from insertion, then every eight hours after that. Now the key numbers to know of when to notify the HCP, write this down, it's always on exams. Bright red blood over 100 mLs per hour after the first hour of placement. Now the key term here that you have to focus on is bright red blood. Worry about the bright red, since this means active hemorrhage. So just think, if the blood is bright, then something ain't right. We must notify the provider, especially after surgery or new insertion within the first eight hours. Now, don't let the NCLEX trick you here. We do not clamp the chest tube. This will only back up heavy drainage and make pressure in the lung cavity worse. And if we see bright red blood, we do not give pain meds as the first intervention. This obviously won't stop the bleeding. So we must notify the provider first with that bright red. Okay, now switching gears, what happens if the blood is dark red? Again, don't let the NCLEX trick you here. Just think D for dark bloody drainage is normal. So we D, document and monitor since it's old blood. Say you're turning a patient two to three days after surgery and suddenly about 200 mLs of dark blood drains in the collection chamber, like all of a sudden. What do you do? Do you freak out and call your mama? Well, no, it's not bright red blood, it's dark blood. So we know that it's old blood. So again, just think of the double Ds here. It's dark blood, so we just document. And don't be alarmed with the amount of this dark bloody drainage since it's a few days after surgery. So remember, timing and color are everything with these drainage questions. Again, our memory trick, just think, dark blood we document, since the blood is old and it's probably been there for a few days. And with bright blood, well, that ain't right blood. So especially within the first few hours of placement, it's new and fresh, we must notify the HCP, that provider. Want more insider tips and tricks for NCLEX style questions? Well, our Simple Nursing membership has exit prep lectures and thousands of questions covering every nursing school and NCLEX topic. Okay, now what do we do for stopped or decreased drainage? Say the patient has consistent output for the entire shift and then all of a sudden, a few hours ago, the drainage stops. Well, question for you here. Do we assess the patient first or the chest tube first? Hmm, well, always assess the patient first and machine second. That's always on the NCLEX and exams. So write it down. We assess the patient first by listening or auscultating lung sounds. Now, we do not want to hear diminished breath sounds because that is a priority. This indicates that the chest tube is not working to improve that airflow and typically means that the patient is now filling up with blood or fluid very deadly. So write it down, diminished breath sounds are priority. Second, we turn cough and deep breathe. And third, we reposition the patient since blood or fluid can collect in one area of that lung space. 
and if the patient's been laying down in a certain position for too long, blood or fluid can collect there as well. Now, Kaplan had a question about this, asking about priority for a client with three-chambered chest drainage system for hemothorax. And the answer is to assess the client's respiratory status frequently. Remember, we assess the patient first and then devices later. So don't let the NCLEX trick you here. We do not adjust the suction. Technically, we need an order for that. And don't assess the chest tube initially. A lot of students get this wrong on their NCLEX and exams. So write it down and know it. We always assess the patient first before machines. Now, as far as general patient assessment, we do rounds every two hours. We always listen to breath sounds and check the drainage around the chest tube to see if any blood or pus from infection is there. Now, a big one here is subcutaneous emphysema, that trapped air under the skin. Sort of feels like Rice Krispies underneath the skin. Snap, crackle, and pop. Now, this is normal and to be expected on insertion, but here's the key. It should not be growing in diameter. Typically, we mark the patient with a marker to make sure this crepitus is not spreading. Okay, now for the complications that you will be tested on. So write these down. It's the two Ds, disconnection and damage to the chest tube. So what happens when the chest tube itself gets disconnected, cracked, kicked, or even body slammed? Body slammed? Uh, well, yeah, anything could happen. So starting with disconnection from the patient. This typically happens by accident, so we must tell the patient to cough and exhale immediately to prevent air from rushing into that pleural space, causing that deadly tension pneumothorax and collapse in the lung. We basically have a hole in the chest here, right? In essence, we've created a sucking chest wound. So Hesse mentions interventions for a client with a chest tube for pneumothorax. If the tube becomes dislodged, ask the patient to cough and exhale as much as possible. Yes, this prevents air from rushing into that pleural space. And then immediately we do number two, which is apply occlusive petroleum gauze dressing and secure on three sides, not four sides, but three sides. Now, don't let the NCLEX trick you here. Three sides only. This allows air to escape upon exhalation, basically when we breathe out. So the memory trick, only tape three to let the air free. A lot of students get this wrong and choose to tape four sides, which does not allow air out. So pressure can build up inside the chest, causing that deadly tension pneumothorax. Basically so much air pressure that it can push all the organs to one side even the trachea, that windpipe, and eventually collapse the good lung. Now, Kaplan mentions essential equipment to have at the bedside of a client with closed chest drainage system. We have to have a sterile connector, sterile petroleum gauze, this is our occlusive dressing, as mentioned in other question banks, as well as padded clamp. So write that down, sterile petroleum gauze or occlusive dressing. Now, if the chest tube gets disconnected from the collection chamber itself, well, we have two options. For disconnection or damage to the drainage tube, if it's without contamination, then we use an aseptic swab and just simply reconnect it. Now, if there's damage to the water seal itself, resulting in draining all the water out of the seal, then we must place the distal end into sterile saline or sterile water. So once again, write down the keywords, if the water seal chest tube is damaged, we place the distal end into sterile saline. And a little side note here, we never clamp the chest tube. This is only done a few hours before the removal or changing the drainage device. Clamping a chest tube prematurely can cause a deadly tension pneumothorax, which again, can push all the organs and windpipe to one side. Now, speaking of chest tube removal, it's critical to tell the patient these key words. Take a deep breath, hold it, and bear down. That Valsalva maneuver. This is done while the tube is being removed. So write that down. This prevents air from being sucked back into the pleural space, causing that pneumothorax. 
air inside the lung space. Again, we must take a deep breath, hold it, and bear down. Bear down. Not a slight inhalation, but a big one. Then we typically take a chest x-ray afterward just to make sure there's no new air or fluid inside the lung space. Now for the big no-nos, we have three here. Number one, we never milk or strip a chest tube. This could create more pressure within the patient, causing that deadly tension pneumothorax. So just think, stripping can be dangerous. I was this close to stripping, but <laughs> never mind. Just remember, never strip or milk a chest tube. Now, the second thing is we never want to see continuous bubbling in the key term water seal or air leak chamber. The only place that should have continuous bubbling should be the suction chamber, like we're sucking bubbles. Again, think of that seal here. Remember by saying, no blowing bubbles, you seal. And lastly, number three, never clamp during transport. Now, we talked about this before. As a general rule on the NCLEX and exams, we never clamp a chest tube. Technically, clamping is only done a few hours before chest tube removal or when we're changing that drainage device. Because clamping a chest tube prematurely, once again, can cause that deadly tension pneumothorax. Thanks for watching. Did you know you can unlock beautifully handcrafted study guides packed with key points and memory tricks from all our videos? Plus, you'll get access to over 1,200 exclusive videos not on YouTube, all neatly organized by nursing school topic to make that complex nursing knowledge actually stick. You'll also gain thousands of practice questions written by current professors and actual NCLEX writers. So for access to all this and more, click right up here or visit simplenursing.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Happy studying, and we'll see you in the next videos.